you giving, that's how we live it Don't be mad at the system, it's simply how we've existed I hear a lot of people talking like they politicians And choose to be an accountant because it's safe in the business Not because they wanna do it, just because they heard it pays And who the fuck wants to be poor, no one, that's how we've been raised Society is getting heavy, I can feel the weight The pressure of success is like a hundred million pounds of shit it's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Guys, I got a great topic coming our way. I had an officer message me who is having a bit of a concern. Uh, she believes the officer is a bit corrupt and she has tried reporting it. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm believing from what she's telling me here uh, that when she reported it, she may have reported it to like this clique and who she trusted because maybe they were supervisors. And I feel that from way she's telling me that they may have went back and told this individual. So now there's some retaliation going and in, uh, getting involved. Now, obviously, I gave her the right advice because there is pretty much a spot on advice here is, is basically don't let that stop you. Retaliation, bring it as far up as you can go, call SEPA, do whatever you got to do. But at the end, you have to find a way to report that and get that heard. But I know sometimes it's complicated because the pressure of the environment. Sometimes we feel that the pressure wants us to do just the opposite. And in my career, I may disagree with that a bit because I know good officers want bad officers out. So everybody kind of misunderstands that code of silence. I, I don't think they understand why that code of silence exists. So we'll mention that. But for the most part, guys, good officers want bad officers out. So I think this is going to be a great dialogue. We're going to talk about basically corruption. How do you investigate it? Because I have Gary York coming on as well. But we're also going to discuss what you need to do if you witness something that, beyond doubt, is a corrupt act. And we'll even cover part of this retaliation aspect as well, because it does happen, guys. Unfortunately, it does. Now, guys, we have a famous author. Now, it's very tough for me to get her, because, guys, I have made some calls. I spoke to her people, and then I spoke to their people who knew people who knew her. Connie Eileen, what's up, Connie? Oh, you look upset. Oh, <laughs> my God. Oh, my God. Connie Eileen here. <laughs> you guys know I'm always here. I don't know why he's doing that to me today. Um, I am the founder and president of the Civilian Corrections Academy. I'm also the podcast host of The Fly Behind the Wall and the author of The Cage with Her Cocoon. So I am happy to be here, happy to talk about corruption. It's definitely something that's not easy to do, but it's something that we are responsible for doing. So it kind of is what it is, but I look forward to this, this discussion. Yeah, what she means is to report it, not to be corrupted. <laughs> right, exactly. right, right, yeah. <laughs> okay, just want to make sure we're on the same page, you know. But, yes. Uh, I know where you're going. We got it. We got it. Uh, but obviously, Connie, your input's uh, phenomenal. And I like this because we're probably going to get into the mindset of someone um, actually having to report it. And of course, we have our famous investigator who's the author of many books, including a children's book that's out right now. Uh, the two adult books are Inside the Inner Circle and Corruption Behind Bars. What's up, Gary? Hey, how you doing, Anthony? Yeah, tough topic tonight. Tough topic. Um, I've written articles on it for a couple of online uh, sites and, and, of course, Corruption Behind Bars, my book, I have wrote about it. And when you said the problem this person is having, when you just explained it, uh, that terrible word pops up a lot, retaliation. So I think it's good that we talk about it. Hey, Gary, real quick, uh, the kids book, is it released now? Yes, it's um, released. <laughs> there it is, Connie. It's Look called Hooves and, Boots. Hooves and Boots, Fun with Grandma and Grandpa. I left the criminal world for a little while and wrote a fun book about children on the farm with different animals. Yes, Hooves and Boots is on Amazon. Thank you, Anthony. Well, the great thing is he sent a gift to my daughter, so it's on the way. So I'm going to have Mia do her very first review. After she reads it, I'm going to have her do a review and put it right on Amazon because we're going to get it from the heart of an eight-year-old. What does that book mean to her? And she's looking forward to it, Gary. Obviously, she's very familiar with who you are. So now you just become famous in her life. Uh, <laughs> now, guys, this is going to be a great show. We're going to be talking about corruption. Uh, again, it happens. We're not going to run away from it. But what we should do, and I, I really want to try to see if we can give some good advice or if anything, motivate her to do the right thing. 
That's the key. Now, guys, if you haven't the show, Tear Talks for you, brave men and women at work in correction. So please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. We're going to go to our sponsor. We come back. Let's talk about corruption. Stand by. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University. Learn from the leader. I am, we're back. Hey guys, real quick, I know I kind of say hit that bell and get engaged. That really does help our channels. I know Gary has a YouTube channel as well. Um, the engagement lets YouTube know that people are interested in our topic, and then it usually promotes it, hopefully, to people that have similar uh, channels. So, again, it's good for us to try to get that momentum going because we do spread a good message, and we do need people from the outside to hear this message sometimes. It's great, don't get me wrong, when we have ourselves listen, but technically if we want the true change and we want it to happen, people from the outside need to kind of listen to what we have to say to build that respect that this profession needs and deserves. So corruption, let me just quickly talk about this blue line, of the blue code of silence or the thin line of silence, whatever it's called. Okay, so a lot of people think that we protect corrupt acts and, and I disagree with that. Um, unless some, for some reason you're involved, but if you get, for the most part, if you get people that are not involved and they see it, I've seen nine times out of 10, those officers or those staff members do the right thing against the pressure from that little click that may have done the wrong thing. What people don't realize is it's not that easy to do. It's not that we sit there, we want to be corrupt, and it's just hard to do because we're a close-knit group. So we have that mentality that we're family. So when we start to see our brothers and sisters doing something wrong, it takes a lot of courage for someone to step out and, and be that outcast and do what's right. For the people that may not, don't get me wrong, I'm not minimizing it. Yeah, they, they need to step up and they need to do something that's correct. But I want people to understand how hard it is for someone to do that. That's why bravo for the people that do do it. Hopefully this video motivates people. But I want people to understand that sometimes when someone doesn't do it, which I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's not because they're trying to protect corruption. It's because they don't want to be that outcast in a job that they have to be dependent on other people. That's why when it comes to people needing to say something, we as an agency, we as the investigator, the inspectors, we have to protect these individuals. We have to motivate them and make them know that they're not an outcast. But I just wanted to get it out there. You know, it's a very hard thing to do, especially like Gary said and I said, the retaliation aspect. So for those that are doing it, bravo. And for those that are in the process and don't know if they should because they're concerned, hopefully this video motivates. But, but Connie, I want to go to you first. Obviously, I, I know you're a civilian, but you're very aware of this thin blue line, uh, code of silence, whatever it is. I think people misunderstand if it does exist. I think they misunderstand the reasons why it exists. Um, can you kind of give me your perspective? So, you know, I guess my... I being in corrections for so long, I think part of that is, so you do build like this family, right? Whether you are an officer or you're a civilian, when you have great working relationships with the people you work with, that is, they become your family. Just imagine you're working doubles back to back with someone, or you are working in an environment where you guys just had some significant code and you survived it together, right? Like there's so many things that happen, I think, behind the wall that people don't understand that sort of sort of makes that bond amongst us really strong. And so I think one of the big challenges that we come across is that you might have come across someone who is being corrupt or you heard about something, but I think it's very difficult to come to terms that one of your family members is sort of violating the code, right? That like, it's almost like, no, they wouldn't do that or no. So it's like this, I don't want to say you're in denial, but it's almost like this disbelief 
that this is even happening, much less I'm going to come and be the one to report you. Now, it's different if you are like you've witnessed it firsthand and now you've just got like an obligation to come forward because certain corruption itself has a way of creating significant safety and security concerns, whether you're a civilian or not. Right. And so because of that, if you don't come forward, it almost looks as though you are compliant with this corruption or I don't want to say complacent that wouldn't be the right word but are you a part of it are you an accomplice to whatever this is that's happening and could you be seen as one down the line because when the security division begins the the entire operation of investigation right like it isn't like you can uh claim that you didn't know right like because a lot of times it's reviewing the security tapes I've had the the wonderful experience of sitting through hours of security <laughs> tapes to see what happened exactly at what point, who was there, who was around. I mean, we don't have volume. Well, it's not been my experience to have volume on the security tapes. You can just kind of see what has transpired. It's different if someone's recording a code, but if it's an area where it's just the security footage, we don't get to see it. I mean, don't get to hear it, but we see it. So like, I, I feel like there is this, this code of family almost, not, not so much just this, this blue line or whatever silver line, whatever line you want to call it. When you work with someone in close quarters for a long period of time, you do become like family, especially when you start to know about their family. You know, when someone's wife, their husband, their children, things that they're going through. And so it's very difficult to kind of just be like, yeah, I'm just going to report you, especially if you don't have all the evidence, right? So it's it's one of those things that I think ultimately it is challenging, but we just have an obligation to do it. Right. And, and the unique thing is, guys, and actually it's in the uh, in my book, in Manipulation, it's hard when it's a feeling as opposed to something you've obviously seen. And even if you obviously see it, we're so connected. I may find ways to justify and deny it. You know, I, I've seen it happen where, you could have someone that you respect do something and you will justify it differently than someone you don't respect doing the same exact thing. You know, it's just how you interpret the person and that connection with that person. So when they reinforce that family connection behind that wall, you know, it's like no different than, you know, turning in your brother, your sister, whatever it is, because of the mentality. Some people really do embrace it to that heightened level, you know? And, and again, you know, it's, it's a matter of, having to, and I'm sure this is very hard, and Gary could talk about this, is to try to, when, when you're interviewing someone that obviously saw something, and it sucks because they're put in a very bad situation. They're not the bad one, but they've been put in a situation where unfortunately a bad situation occurred. You could see the conflict in them where they want to tell the truth, but they also have to go back to work and work with these individuals, Gary. So how, how, do, you, how do you motivate someone to tell the truth when they're afraid that if they go back, there's that chance that they're going to be that social outcast. Well, I've done a lot of interviews over uh, a 12 year period with correctional officers that had to be called in because we saw them as Connie stated on the videotape that we reviewed. So we know they were there. We already know they saw everything and we asked them to come in as a witness. I'm talking about interviewing a witness now who saw something. And I've actually had in some, in some severe cases, the witnesses that we know saw it deny that they saw anything. And you can literally see that they're scared. A couple of times that uh, we had a, a case where they were scared to say anything because it's funny, you mentioned the family at the beginning. This group called themselves the family, but for the wrong reason. We are a family in corrections. We, should, we all need to care and watch each other's back. But this family was doing things that they shouldn't be doing and covering for each other. And, and these officers were actually threatened by the other officers. Keep your mouth shut or else. And they were met by these people off duty saying, keep your mouth shut or else. And then you have exactly what Connie was discussing. Just the mere fact 
that that's my brother or sister in uniform. I just can't believe they did it. I, I, I don't uh, I don't want to say anything against them. And it's very hard sometimes to explain. Listen, this is a witness interview. But if you don't tell me the truth, this can turn into something worse for you. Because being untruthful during an investigation or being untruthful during a sworn taped interview or an affidavit can get you terminated from your job. I've always said never, ever let anyone doing something corrupt or illegal or wrong take the food away from your family's mouths. Don't let that happen. Don't let someone take your job, your medical benefits, your dental benefits, and your family's food and, and, and welfare away from you because you're trying to cover for them. It's it's not worth it. And that word retaliation, I've talked about that in videos and articles. It's just sickening if you happen to run into a chain of command who tries to retaliate against the person reporting the incident. I'm sure in many other states it's the same. In Florida, in our statutes, it says, as a correctional officer in the 944 statutes here in Florida, if you witness a crime, you must report it under the Florida Department of Law Enforcement rules where they watch your officer certification. It also there's a clause in there that states you must report somebody conducting a crime, whether no matter who it is, nurse, librarian, maintenance man and officer in uniform. It's just something we're told to do, and it's even written law that we need to do this, but yet we're still seeing retaliation. That, that makes me think about other things. I'll stop here and we'll talk about it later, but where's the mindset of those people retaliating against someone who wants to report a crime? And my, and, and my last part here is corruption taints the image of all our honest correctional officers, all our honest, hardworking officers, and corruption's kills us. Corruption hurts us. It puts us in danger. Why would anybody want to stop somebody from reporting? Right. And the reason why we had this first part of the dialogue is, again, not to minimize or justify why somebody wouldn't report. It's not that. But you have to kind of embrace their mindset, like Gary said, and just kind of see what can motivate someone to say something or what can lessen that motivation. And I think that's part of this dialogue, because, again, as an investigator, how you get that person to open up depends on the context of why they're not opening up, you know? So, so it's good to know why that person doesn't want to open up. And I think that for people that let's say aren't directly involved, obviously the people that are directly involved, we know they have a reason for not opening up. You know, that's where the investigators can lessen, you know, who is more involved or not and really try to find someone that can flip on the rest, uh, which obviously is needed. Cause again, you don't want that type of stuff in, in your facility. You don't want that corruption because even if it's uh, excessive use of force, whatever it is, eventually you could be put in that same situation by those same individuals. And then now you're are fighting for your life or fighting for your career and having to make that choice. And it's not an easy choice, but it's a choice that has to be made with conviction. You're trusted in, in this position, you know, so you have to do what's right. Also, sometimes, and I, I love kind of going back to what Connie said, how we perceive things. Um, Sometimes things are surface, you know, catching an officer, give out contraband or something, make that surface. I mean, hopefully there's no way that could be misinterpreted. Um, but sometimes use of force can blur, you know. Uh, and if you see, you know, something that what you feel could be excessive, but you're kind of on the fence, sometimes what defines what you see in front of you are the people that you respect around you. And if they're not doing nothing and if they're not, you know, acting how it's supposed to be, you know, if they're not going after to stop it or doing whatever it is, then that could maybe in your mind think, wow, maybe that wasn't that bad. That's why we hold supervisors to that high level. When you have a use of force and, and it goes excessive and there's a supervisor on scene that doesn't do nothing, that's a big problem because what we're hoping is that first off, that supervisor, he's in charge or she's in charge, but the moment that they go forward to stop the excessive use of force, other people will see that and it could motivate people to go ahead and, 
you know, stop it as well. That you need that one person to kind of break what they call the bystander effect. That's what it's called. It's called the bystander effect. Uh, but with that said, it all depends on, like you got a new boot, a rookie, who, you know, is kind of trying to figure out their way in this world in corrections. And, you know, they build that strong bond to, you know, a few of the, the COs. And let's say at one point, these COs go rogue. You know, the officer who's still new, I mean, I know we look at things and say, wow, the officer should have known. And it may be looking back at it, but sometimes going in that moment, that officer is trying to piece together in their mind what exactly they're seeing and they're connecting it to who exactly is doing it. So if I have respect for these people, I may be entering the scene with a bit of a bias, you know, because I'm using these people to define what it is that I'm actually seeing. And that's where good investigators have to come in. They have to kind of explain, listen, let me just tell you what happened and why it's wrong. And then that person who has the conflict inside of them, they, they know it. They just haven't had someone explain it to them. So all of a sudden, that conflict starts to kind of get tighter and tighter to the point where it's like, you know what? I, I felt that was happening. But now that you've explained it to me, this is what I saw. But it takes an experienced investigator to kind of understand how to go ahead and motivate that people based on why they're not saying something. So I'll, I'll go with Gary first. Does, does that matter? Is, is, is what I'm saying correct? Like you have to, if you have a witness that really didn't do nothing wrong, just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And for some reason, they didn't just come up and volunteer the information. You had to chase after them because of maybe what you saw on the video. Do you have to try to get a perspective um, to understand why they don't want to say nothing, to motivate them to say something, because not all the time I think they're hiding it purposefully. Like, I, I, you know, sometimes is they're good officers. They just may not have an understanding of what just happened. Would you agree with that, yeah. Barry? Well, first of all, you don't ever want a witness to become a, a subject in your investigation. And, you know, I've seen some people that are new and I've seen some people that are a little bit more timid and they're scared to say something. Well, remember, they, they, I can't ask them questions um, directly, but I could talk to them for a while before they write their affidavit or before I turn the tape recorder on. Depending on the seriousness of the case, we'll either just get them to write a, a sworn affidavit as a witness. If it's a very serious case, we may put a witness on tape as well. Some agencies tape everybody. But you can talk with them for as long as you want and, and let them know why it is the right way, why the truth will prevail. I have even done this. Some people may think that's wrong, but it's not. It's a witness. You can't do this with a suspect or a subject, but you can do it with a witness. I've said, listen, I've already talked to the warden about you. And I have, I, I, I have, I'm not going to tell him I've talked to the warden without really talking to him. The warden says you have a clean record. I've checked your record. It is clean. Nobody is out to get you, but you are going to get yourself if you don't tell the truth, because that is what hurts most people. That is what gets most people in trouble, being untruthful. And I know you're scared. I had to do this in that one case I talked to you about when the witnesses were getting threats. I know you're scared. I know these people have already met with you. I know they've already threatened you. I know they've already told you not to make a statement. You have got to stand up for yourself. And, and I also tell them what I told you earlier about the speech of save your job, save your family's uh, food on the table and so forth. You know, you just have to take time if you have an investigator that just runs in there, you got to tell me this has happened. Look, people out there know this has happened. You're going to tell me, you know what happened. And you're going to tell me the truth. They clam up. That scares them even more. Now I'm the bad guy. Now you've got people retaliating against you. You've got people threatening you not to make a statement. And then I come in as the inspector and give the old tough guy routine. You know, I had a supervisor that always taught us you get more flies with honey than you do with being the tough guy. I don't like the tough guy routine. I don't like it at all. Just talk normal to the person. Talk like a human being, human to human. 
and get that witness to understand and get their head in the right place. Because that tough guy talk just adds you in the group that they're scared of. Plus it doesn't, plus it doesn't set the foundation to connect with that witness, to understand why they're not saying the right thing. Even if you feel that, well, I feel like you do want to do the right thing. So let, let's try to see why you're not doing it. So again, you go with the tough guy, automatically there's going to be a resistance between you and that witness. But if you go by and set that foundation, that connection, and try to figure out why that person uh, is hesitant. Now, Connie, I, I think even in your position, maybe as civilians too, sometimes they may witness something that they don't really know is right or wrong. I'm not talking about the, ob again, not the obvious surface stuff, maybe something that could be blurred like a use of force. And sometimes when they get pulled in to this interview with this inspector, they really don't know what they saw was right or wrong. Not knowing that they're not held to the same responsibility as custody when it comes to stopping the use of force. Uh, believe it or not, civilians are not, uh, custody definitely will be held responsible for that. Civilians, I don't know, I guess it depends on, on the state. I'm assuming that because they're not security staff, they're going to be very hesitant in getting involved with what security staff is doing. So I don't know if they're going to be held liable, but I do know that they can be used at any time to be a witness. But do you think sometimes what's right or wrong could be blurred? And then it really does matter as to, you know, like if I want this person to open up, I need to understand why they're not telling me something. Absolutely. So I've been in situations where we had a major, we had an event and, um, you know, the lines were blurred, you know, whether or not civilians should have been aware of what custody was supposed to do versus not. And if you've never been in a situation, a lot of times you don't really know what's appropriate to respond because by default, the civilian would sort of default to custody as the lead on any event or incident or code or what have you. And so in this particular incident, there was an event where an inmate was out of cell and was kind of like crawling on the floor and no one really knew what was going on. So the civilian assumed that in order for the inmate to get out to be crawling on the floor that someone popped the cell. And so the civilian didn't think to go over to the inmate because clearly there was something else transpiring before the civilian got into got on the scene. But long story short, in that instance, they thought that the civilian should have gotten involved, even though she didn't at the time, because there was some sort of blurred line as to who was responsible to responding to this inmate who was on the floor. Now, granted, you fast forward, you look at the security tapes, you go through all the motions and you kind of see that there was some kind of exchange that took place before when the civilian got on the scene. You know, it was within her scope to be involved, but she didn't know where that line was. So if custody was already doing something or they were on the phone trying to fix something or, you know, whatever was being happening on the back end, she wasn't aware of it. And I feel like there are just some times where as a civilian, what we think you guys do may be different from the reality. And so we may not get involved or we might get involved because of our interpretation on what actions should be taken in the moment. And I know medical is going to have a heavy role in that, though, because obviously life or death. And sometimes when you have these codes or they're trying to put that inmate into that VPRC chair, uh, medical may be there, you know, to make sure that um, there's, you know, they're doing it correctly. But usually there's a good working relationship, hopefully between at least mm -hmm. the supervisor and, and then the medical department. But the, the other thing I want to talk about, guys, is even little things, like you have an officer coming in your unit that doesn't want you to put them in their logbook. Or, you know, people wonder why, oh, uh, I can't believe that officer just gave that inmate a sandwich that came from the officer's dining room. These are just, you know, well, why are you sweating that? It's a small thing. No, nah, there's a reason why, guys. I mean, I remember having a supervisor tell me, like, you know, you may not think it's a big thing, you know, just looking at, you know, just a sandwich in general, but let's talk about what could have happened here. Well, let's talk about what is happening already. So obviously the obvious stuff of what could be hidden in the sandwich that we don't know about because this wasn't gone through the proper channels for this inmate to get, but also what led to that relationship where that officer thought he needed to do that, where he thought he could just get a sandwich, 
and just give it to an inmate. So there's just so many things in play that sometimes we don't see things right away. Now, for the officer who's going through this, and you, this is the officer, first off, bravo, because you want to take the initiative. So you know that you saw something that didn't sit well with you. And usually if it's something like, uh, that's not like really corrupt, but maybe something a little bit small, maybe just a bad habit or something minor, you know, I would usually tell you, go ahead and go talk to that person one-on-one, -on -one, you know, and, and make it known that this is what you expect. And, you know, usually that usually works. But if this is something that goes beyond that, then it becomes your duty to do exactly what you're doing, which is report it to the next level up. The concern is sometimes you don't know who you're reporting it to, especially if you see that maybe the sergeant that I got to report it to is buddy-buddy with the officer. That's the problem. So at that point there, that's when you have those anonymous notes that you could drop to the administrator, to the investigative agency or whatever it is. Or if you want to put your name on it, you know, you can put your name on it. But if there's those anonymous notes, those get investigated just as much as a note with a name on it. Or they should be getting investigated just as much because even though a lot of the times those anonymous no notes are probably a... Uh, a ploy for something or, you know, maybe just a game to get us running around a little bit, there could be the chance that it's not. So admin, the investigative authorities, they have to act on that. So the moment that you feel that you went the next route or you can't go the next route, you know, whatever the case may be is that's the other option. Now, if I went the next route and I felt that now I'm being retaliated against because I went that next route, I'm probably going to be very specific and I'm probably going to find myself walking directly into that inspector's office or the administrator's office, wherever I got to go to let them know this is what's happening. And I'm going to start documenting everybody I talk to, including the investigator, including the administrator, because now I want to hold people responsible. Gary, what's your thoughts on that next level? Well, we've actually had people. First of all, we have a 1-800 hotline that people can call and they don't have to leave their name or address. And I know cell phones sometimes can be, uh, your name might show up. So if you're in fear of that, use another way to call. But we have that and we've done, I've been assigned investigations off that hotline. Officer so-and-so is smuggling drugs with inmate so-and-so. Well, that's enough information right there for me to start an investigation, you know, uh, through the inmates mail, through the inmates JPay, through the inmates phone calls. We can check a lot of things that way. Um, but we've also had people call directly to the IG office. You know, we have regional offices. So I would be in region five and they would call directly and speak with my supervisor. Now my supervisor would ask them every question you must ask. Have you reported this to your sergeant? Lieutenant, Cap, you have to ask those questions. If they say no, why, why didn't you report it to them? Then they start saying, well, I can't. The sergeant is very close friends with this officer. Or the lieutenant goes golfing with him every day, and, they, and I've already felt some retaliation before from something I mentioned about this officer. You know, but you have to ask these questions. Why are you not reporting this to your chain of command? That must be asked. And then... Um, the supervisor will uh, start an investigation. Hey, why did you not go to your warden about it? Why did you not go to your system warden about it? You have to ask all those questions, but yes, those type of things you mentioned have occurred. They've been investigated and many of them have been found out to be uh, substantiated, unfortunately, because this honest officer was trying to do his or her job, trying to do the right thing and meeting resistance within their own institution. So they had to step outside the boundaries of outside their comfort zone to the unknown. One more place officers have gone directly to the state attorney. And the state attorney says, well, why have you left your agency? Because I don't trust this, 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 or this. Well, it does get back to the IG office because the state attorney is going to call us folks and say, hey, we got a, we got a complaint, but this is more in your area. and you know, listen, there's corruption everywhere. 
We've had a few corrupt inspectors here in Florida go down, and that's good, and I'm glad. But I want to tell you that 99% of your inspector officers will listen to your complaint and do a fair and impartial investigation. Would I sit here and tell you that there's uh, 100% prison inspectors that have never been corrupt? Heck no. We've had some corrupt prison inspectors, and they've been arrested. Another thing to getting back to, we take care of our own. Uh, I think you mentioned that at the beginning, Anthony, that a lot of people don't believe we take care of our own. I can show you some cases where prison inspectors here in Florida have been investigated and taken care of, either criminally or administratively. That's what we have to do in every section of our department. Trust that by reporting incidents, we will take care of it. Well, and you have to also know there is some common sense here, too. Like, let's say you see the lieutenant doing something wrong. You can't go to your sergeant. You know, right. you just, you know, you can't go a level down. You you have to do your, your best to try to get to the highest level possible. Now, if by chance it's the administrator, well, then you have great reason to kind of go to that either central office or that state attorney or whatever the case may be. But But the key here is that you need to do what's correct because in the end, you can get caught up. No one's untouchable. Especially when they go to, like, let's do, the, do that intimidation and all that other stuff. You know, the scare tax are, the scare tactics that they're employing is to kind of get you to stop doing what's right. But in the long run is if the investigators are, ob are able to find out that you knew, even if it's a little bit of a whisper of it, because you're on that custody side, uh, maybe even on the civilian side, too, you're held for that. Because the moment you see something or you know of something that could be going wrong, you have an obligation. That obligation is to say something because that's what's in your job function. So now that intimidation, none of that stuff's going to prevent you from getting in trouble. Oh, but they threatened me. It don't matter because you knew something that, you know, could have jeopardized the facility at a higher level. So now you have to make sure that you do what's right. But I would, ex I would expect, I would expect some level of protection for that individual who's trying to do what's right. I think that's a great way to motivate people to do what's right is if they can trust into the agency that they're going to protect that individual. I see Connie in agreement with that because I knew, I know that's going to come up. I know there are going to be people that are going to say, well, Ganji, I'm going to do what's right, but how do I know I'm going to be protected? Well, well, Connie, I mean, obviously to my mind, you want me to do what's right. The first thing I'm going to say is what's going to happen as this moves further up. I mean, am I going to be protected from retaliation? I, I mean, you know, Connie, how important is that to you? That's absolutely important. From the moment someone steps into my office with any sort of information, you know, the, the goal is to make sure, one, that they feel comfortable, and two, that I've provided them with the security that they need, even if it's just the mental security that as they, because what happens, what I've experienced anyway, is that someone can come forward and then when they start thinking they're not safe, like that psychological safety isn't there, they start recoiling, they start backtracking, or, you know, they change the original statement. They're not as strong in their conviction as they was when they first came into your office. So it's really important, I think, up front to make sure people know that they're supported and to be transparent. How are you going to support me? How are you going to make sure that I'm safe, right? If it's a matter of saying, so here's what you gave me this document today. Here's who's going to get it next and be able to explain the process. Because I think when people can understand the process and how safety is sort of built into that process, at the end of the day, people want to know when will the person who I'm reporting find out, right? And what that's going to look like. I've gotten that question asked. Like, so when, is, when do they get informed that someone's reported them? Because sometimes people are like, I don't want to be at work when that happens, right? It's like all these little things that we think like, what's the big deal, right? But the big deal is that maybe if I was the only person who saw you and then now you get this notification, I'm, I'm confronted with you immediately as opposed to I'm not even here and perhaps I'm not the person that reported you. People want to remain anonymous because they don't want the backlash. But I think if along the way you can explain how that person will be protected, 
I think that helps to smooth things over a bit and make people feel a little more confident in coming forward. Hey, Gary, I definitely got to get your input on this because I noticed that when the case is ongoing, there may be some level to protect the individual because that person that that's reporting it has value at that moment. You know, uh, you need them. My concern is when it's all done. I feel like sometimes the people that made the effort to do the right thing get forgotten about almost immediately when the investigators get what they want and now they move over into whatever case they got next. I mean, I mean, what what can you do? I mean, during the investigation, but I also think more importantly, because at one point it may be made, it may be made apparent who this person is. So maybe like Connie said, during the investigation, you can kind of keep this person quiet because that's a good thing, you know. You know, not let everybody know you have this ace in the hole here, but eventually it's going to be made known. I mean, you're going to go to trial and the lawyers, they're going to need to know who this person is because this is, you know, someone that they have to challenge. It's the main person. So what are we doing to protect the person during? Yes, but more importantly to me, after. I always tell witnesses who say, look, I, I, I'm probably going to have to testify somewhere down the road. They're going to know it was me or the person who reported the incident is going to say they're going to know it's me. Well, you can't, you never lie to anybody about anything. You tell them, listen, this road could be a little bit rough. It could be a little bit rough. I, I don't sugarcoat it with them. There's no need to do that. They need to know the truth. You may face some retaliation. And if you do, I always gave them my card. Call me immediately. Call me. Yes. Don't worry about anybody else. Call me direct. Because number one, I want to know if somebody's tampering with my witness. Because I'm going to go to the state attorney who I sent my investigation to and say, now I want these officers charged with tampering with a witness. Add that on there, please. Most state attorneys are going to go along with what we say if we show them that they're tampering with a witness. And I let them know. I let the witness know. I will, I will go after them for tampering with a witness. I also know that you have to let them know that you're available at any time. You know, this eight to five business is a bunch of baloney. I don't like eight to five inspectors. There are some out there. You have to be a 24 seven inspector. You have to answer that phone. You know, we're a signed phone, not our private phone, our assigned state phone. You have to answer that phone at one in the morning, midnight. Maybe it is a concerned witness, a scared witness. If you're a good inspector, you're going to talk to them. And then the next morning, I'm going to go to my boss and say, look, boss, witness called me in this case last night. We need to do something. You don't want to be moved from the institution because that makes you look like, oh, look, they're moving them temporarily to another institution. You know, and you've seen some wardens say, well, we're going to move them to admin to answer phones until this case is over. You know, I, I as an inspector can't control that. But, you know, things like this, I tell them, these are things you may face until this is over. I also tell them that I will be a witness for them if later on they need an attorney. And I'll quickly state, the guy told me I could use his name. I'm not, though. A sergeant friend of mine right now reported corruption, bad corruption. These officers were arrested at two different institutions here in Florida just within the last two years. He had officers make false allegations against him and they retaliated and put false statements against him. He was investigated and got fired because the chain of command did not protect him from retaliation. Pretty soon you'll see me do a video. Uh, he went and got a civil attorney. He won his case. The hearing officer said there is nothing that the agency has shown me to prove that he did any of these things. And he was retaliated against, and they recommended he get full back pay and reinstated back to sergeant. Never give up that fight. You will win in the end with, with being an honest officer. And I say these stories not to scare people. Obviously, Anthony, you have somebody concerned about being retaliated against. It happens. This guy fought it. Don't let them win, those people that retaliate against you. Don't let them win. Yeah, the, the job that we're in has inherent risk almost every angle, uh, sad to say. I, I wish that, you know, we could promise easy roads or easier days to come, but it comes with the responsibility of your job. Uh, you know, you put yourself in a situation where, you know, 
sad to say, but you know, when you're at this job, generally you're going to see things you don't want to see. Uh, it's just where, where you now work. It's just, you know, you're working in a prison, you're working in a jail and it's just, you're going to be exposed to things that you don't want to see, but once you see it, you have to do what's right. And I think a big part of this discussion is what we did was we explained why somebody may not want to do what's right. It's not always because they're trying to protect corruption, but also what can motivate them to do something right. And, and adverse of that too, what, what could stop them from doing something right. But, but I think the key here uh, and to kind of sum it up is that you have to understand, you know, the consequences of them doing that right behavior. It isn't always, it isn't always about protecting corruption. It's about being that social outcast and you're in a world where we're required to be connected. Uh, and then also, if I'm going to do this, who's going to protect me? You know, because I'm going to need protection. So who's going to protect me? And sometimes the sad thing is, is that, yes, you have people that are going to come up and do the right thing, regardless uh, of someone pushing them or not. That's just who they are. I saw it. And I'm going to do what I got to do. I mean, I remember having a, a guy on the show or no, I was watching the show that had a correctional officer on it. And he actually said something very unique on his first day on the job. When everybody, you know, got a chance to introduce themselves, he stood up, said his name and said, I'm going to tell you something right now, guys. Anybody does something foolish in front of me, I'm going to report him. And he sat down. He set the standard right from the get go, right at that academy. And he said through his time on the job, he's only connected with the best officers because those are the officers that, you know, had the same belief as he did. But I love that. I wish I could go back and do that. You know, go back first day. My name is Anthony Gange. You don't do anything foolish in front of me. I'm going to report you. Uh, you know, um, and again, we're talking about severe stuff, obviously, you know, talking about that, that stuff that threatens the safety and security of the facility, no matter how small, because it starts small. Um, but the key is, is really to understand that, you know, what motivates somebody to do something or what motivates somebody to report something, we need to try to encourage that and not do what we normally do, which is, unfortunately, it's the sad thing, guys. But once the person does what they're supposed to do, we forget about them. You know, that person is doing something that's extremely hard. And somewhere along the line, whether it's done privately, you know, or if it's publicly, but most likely if it's privately, somewhere along the line, there has to be a thank you said to that person. Whether it's from the agency, the state attorney, from the administrator, because you need it encouraged, even if it's done in private, you know, because you don't want to put that person out there. I respect that. But they need to know that this takes more than just there's so much courage involved. And there's also, you know, again, the consequence of, am I going to be retaliated against by the people that I need to depend on? Think about that guys. Just think about that just for a second. You know, if we think of the prison, which I technically don't, but let's just say some of us do in the us first them mentality, look how tight that makes us. So now if I report somebody, look at this now, I'm on an Island guys by myself, vulnerable to both sides. So it's a very hard move. But again, bravo, because this person is just looking to do what's right, um, knows that this is the outcome, is willing to take the risk. And I just hope that the agency does good by this individual. And like Gary said, tampering witnesses, whatever it is, and if need be, if this person... You know, I would go as far as this, but it's tough for me to recommend this because I don't want people to misuse it either. I don't want people making up allegations in the hope that this outcome could happen. But I feel sometimes if the person does the right thing and for some reason, let's say you're reporting a very high level corruption to the point where no matter where this person goes, it's not going to be safe for them. I think at certain points, you know what? This person did what they needed to do, pension them out. I know some people will be thinking like, oh, that's crazy, Ganji. Only if it's for the right reasons. You have to make sure 
that you do what's right. Because think about the rest of that person's career, you know, having to stay in that career day by day, you know, ha having to deal with whatever could come their way. Because again, if it's coming from the higher up, sometimes you're not going to catch everybody that they were connected to. You're not because you could be the higher ups, you know, so that person could always be, you know, threatened or just makes it a very tough career. And you want to motivate people to do something right. So do right by that person. But again, the only concern is you may get people that will make up shit just to get that pension. So got to be careful. I mean, I work in a prison long enough to know that a good intent can easily be, you know, spun around for something nefarious. Um, hey, Gary, anything you'd like to say in closing? I just want to say uh, I, I appreciate all the honest, hardworking officers. And come on, the corrupt officers are a small percentage. They just make everything look blown out of proportion. And, of course, the media grabs that, blows it out of proportion, and makes all officers look bad. So if the honest, hardworking officers stick together, you, you, you'll you win against all the corrupt officers or corrupt prison staff. There's, there, you'll win. So just stick together, honest officers, do the right thing, and you will, you'll defeat the corruption. And stay safe and thank you for your service. Yeah, guys, by the way, only a small percentage, guys, here, but it's still a good topic to discuss because that small percentage can affect somebody greatly, especially if the only one dealing with that. And before, before I go to Connie, Gary, the reason why I mentioned the pension thing is because obviously there could be that seep or that retaliation, and there is an effort from the agency. This person did something correct. We have to protect them from retaliation. So now if it gets to the point where there's a concern and you can't, I think that the agency needs to take that step. So are we on the same page where as a last resort, you know, maybe it's best that we give this person their pension. They did what needed to be done. But unfortunately here, I wish we could catch everybody that's involved. But sometimes it's, it's not that easy. Well, it's a great thing you just brought up because that sergeant I just spoke of, they, his attorney gave the agency the alternative. Give him his full pension and retire him now. And you don't have to worry about it since you didn't protect him from retaliation or give him his back pay and put him back as sergeant. They gave the agency the choice. Yeah, because the key really is the protection. And as an agency, if you can't step up and do it, that's on you now. So if you can't step up and do it, then you have to let that, per in my opinion, you have to let that person go because you're failing to do the number one job, which is to protect people so they can report the corruption. Uh, but again, always gotta be careful with the people that misuse that. I always want to say that again and again, because I know I'm going to have that one person that says, well, again, people will take advantage of that. I know. But again, sometimes you, you that's where you have to make sure you research the information and, you know, case by case basis. Connie, what's your, what's your thoughts on that before you go into your closing remarks? Do you think that sometimes that could be a move? I, I do. I believe that sometimes it has to be a move. You know, um, I don't necessarily feel that when you have someone who step up to do the right thing, that they should kind of be just left out there hanging. I feel like it doesn't incentivize the right behavior when we don't do the right thing. All right, Connie, you have anything you'd like to say in closing? In closing, I just want to say that we are all the face of this industry. And so when we aren't stepping up and doing the right thing, we all take the hit on the chin, right? Because no matter how much good we're all out there trying to do, those few bad apples usually are the ones who get splashed across the media. And they're the ones who make the impression as to what really goes on in corrections. And they're a poor representation of us. And so I think in us always being our best selves, our most professional selves, we always have to show up and we have to stand up for what's right. I love that. And, and guys, real quick, for some people, reporting corruption could be easy. For some, it could be hard. I mean, it all depends on circumstance. I mean, you could have a rookie officer do something foolish and a senior officer have no problem stepping up, but reverse the scenario. A rookie officer sees senior officers doing something foolish or that senior officer that always does something right, you know, that you expect integrity from, Maybe his best friend gets caught up doing something. So, you know, just understanding the circumstances, but again, still saying that you still have to do what's right. It helps us understand the mindset so we can go ahead and motivate the right behavior, formulate a plan. Because I like what Gary said before, you don't just go in there aggressively expecting the truth. You build that connection and you try to pull the truth out. And then again, obviously there's that promise to protect the individuals who are going to take that risk, you know, whether it's because they can't sleep at night or, whether because, you know, 
it's just the right thing to do. And this is who they are. So we, again, like even Connie, how do we motivate that? So I think it was a great dialogue. Bravo to this young lady who was making the effort. Uh, bad move from the agency if you're not supporting the effort and she's getting retaliated against. Um, again, a lot of stuff could be blurred. Uh, but this person here saw something that didn't agree with her. And she's trying to do the right thing. So at this point here, keep trucking. And then now I put it on the agency. You're doing what has to be done. Now, is the agency doing enough? That's a good question to ask. As always, guys, the show is TFW. If you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. Stay safe. Whoa.